Welcome to Aurora Connects. This is episode 14 for June 26, 2020, Bay Area Artistic Directors. I'm Juan Monique Williams, Associate Artistic Director at Aurora Theater. And as always, I'm joined by Josh Costello, Artistic Director. Hey, Josh. Hey, Don. How's it going today, Josh? Not bad. How are you? I'm great. Excellent. Um, and I have a good quote for today. All right. It's not from a play. Uh, this is a quote from George C. Wolf uh, from an interview that appears in The Director's Voice, Volume 2. The producer side of me is really the service side of me. I grew up with a very strong sense of responsibility, very specifically from a racial context. I was taught that if you get into the room, you need to open the doors and windows so that others can get in as well. That thought process has spread to the rest of my work and life. It's not enough that you get yours. You must create structure so that other people, other artists can do their work as well. So the side of myself that feels responsible, that's the producer side of me. It's a job that requires tremendous ego and energy, but I think has very limited ego satisfaction. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I'm sure Josh, you could guess a little bit why, why I picked that, but um, uh, of course, I, we're all directors in the room today, and the four of you, you plus our three honored guests, are artistic directors, which is a different job, right, than just mm -hmm. that of the director. Um, and so I'll be really interested in sort of framing our conversation around how you're opening doors and windows, um, especially in a, in a virtual age. Yes? I love that quote. Thank you. That was great. Um, I want to uh, make sure everyone knows that memberships are available for our 2020-2021 season. Uh, memberships include tickets to any live theater we're able to produce through July 2021, as well as access to all of our online content, including our original audio drama that we talked about a couple weeks ago with our three playwrights. So um, please do go to our website at auroratheater.org and uh, purchase a membership for 2020-2021. We're really excited about this new program. Uh, and while you're there, you can make a donation to Aurora Theater company as well. Thank you so, so much. Great. And I'll remind folks that they can comment in the YouTube chat box or on Facebook if that's where they're watching. We love it if you hit like and subscribe. And we are standing by to take questions live every Friday, so don't be shy. Um, but if you want to give us more feedback, more robust, you want to tell us about guests you want on the show, what quotes you'd like us to read, you can always email us at connects at auroratheater.org. C-O-N-N-E-C-T-S at auroratheater.org. All right, we're going to bring in our wonderful guests for today. We have three uh, wonderful artistic directors from around the Bay Area. Uh, Mina Marita from Crowded Fire, Eric Ting from Cal Shakes, and Pam McKinnon from ACT. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. you very much. Love that quote, Don. That was amazing. Mm. Oh, thank you. Um, that's George. <laughs> Great. Well, let's just jump right in. I'd love to hear from each of you um, a little bit about your background, of course, how you how you came to directing, but even more specifically, how you found yourself sitting in the artistic director's chair at your respective organizations. Um, we've learned that calling on people seems to keep it clean in this uh, new Zoom world. So I'll start with Mina. Um, it's great to be here and see all of your faces, uh, and I'm looking forward to the conversation today. So um, just in terms of in a nutshell, uh, I was working as a director in New York and actually was at Tisch School for the Arts studying directing, uh, found my way there because I was going to be an illustrator actually, and it was lonely work. Smoked way too many cigarettes, drank way too much espresso, and I wanted to be around other artists uh, in a more collaborative setting um, and in community. So I found my way to directing and was encouraged to um, think about directing um, primarily because it was much more conceptual. And I found that I was very good at creating a space in a room with many other artists. So found my way there. I love the work. Uh, and then was at Berkeley Rep uh, as the artistic fellow and then ended up being there for another number of years. I think all told it was about eight years. Um, and then um, learned so much from directors all around the country. 
um, and learned about what it was that I wanted to pursue, um, had actually decided not to pursue anything career oriented because I wanted to focus on the art. And then Marissa Wolf, who had been in the artistic fellowship before me and had been artistic director um, at Crowded Fire, left to pursue her career. And um, I had an opportunity to really think about if I wanted this role. And so I spent a lot of time journaling and mission created a pers personal mission statement, which I still stand by, which is wanting to have um, uh, a commitment to creating an artistic community that would really center um, voices, um, BIPOC voices at the time. You know, it was a different language um, and that language continues to change. Um, but it was important to me to have values in the community that I was working in and then creating work that was uh, experimental and pushing the idea of what theater could be. Um, and especially interrogating the status quo, uh, which is the type of um, the type of questions. Anything that's interrogative uh, usually is where I would like to most live, and that is how I found my way to being an artistic director for Crowded Fire Theater in San Francisco. That's so wonderful. Um, so many things I didn't know about you. I mean, not in just that little bit. How great! Why don't we go to Eric next? Eric, you're muted. Ta-da, better? Yes. All right, hey everyone. Um, interrogate is such an amazing verb. I love that verb so much. Um, uh, so so my my story, I guess there's there's three pieces to my story. One is, is that my mother ran a restaurant for about 25 years. And, um, and I always say that everything that I know about running a theater, I learned from my mom. Uh, the other thing is I also was an artist. I started, I was a visual artist too, and um, also found it deeply isolating. Um, and so I think I fell into the theater for the fellowship. Um, and I have a very distinct memory. It was a strange, it's a strange memory, but I, it's like sort of, I grew up in a Chinese American family and, um, and there wasn't a lot of sort of physical displays of affection within that family. And so, um, you know, there was, there was immense love, but there was never the kind of like, the, the physical displays of it. And I just remember, like, I remember taking an acting class entirely by accident. Um, and, and like the kind of the first visceral memory of being hugged as an adult was in that class. Um, there was just something really profound about that moment of contact. Um, and then as far as how I ended up running a theater, you know, though, uh, um, my career in the professional theater began at a theater in, Connecticut Long Wharf Theater. And I was there for about 11 years in total. And a lot of the work that I, I did as a director back then was around new works and around advocating for writers of color um, and around community engagement for the organization. And uh, I think when the opportunity to apply for this job came up and then the offer to take the job came up, I think the thing that really drove me to say yes was a, a, a recognition that the classical theater, the Shakespeare, like Shakespeare, um, had never been offered to me as an option. And there was something I think really profound about the opportunity to sort of step into a space um, that I had never felt invited to um, and to uh, reimagine what that space could be. And uh, that's kind of how I ended up in California. And oh, there's a awesome. slide of a show. Yeah, I'm gonna stop now though. That's it. That's my story. <laughs> That's so great. Uh, well, Pam, you're the newest transplant here to the to the Bay Area. Gosh, has it even been a year yet? <laughs> so so it's tell us your oh, it's two. It's two. I know time is flying. It will be oh, wow. two July one as far as boots on the ground go, and I had the rare opportunity. Um, as an incoming artistic director to actually program my first season before I came. So yeah, two, wild. So tell us a little bit more about your background. Were you also a visual artist? 
I was not a visual artist. Um, I acted a, you know, a bit as a kid. I also, I played the viola quite seriously, um, starting from age 10. And then um, sort of acting because uh, a friend, our, 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 our junior high drama program got defunded and a friend took it upon himself to say, well, but there has to be theater. And so, you know, drafted some kids and we put on shows that was sort of the first time that I really acted before that I was a kid with a stutter but my puppets didn't stutter so I mean so theater was sort of in me as a kid and then I I directed one thing in high school I directed a short play by Thornton Wilder uh, and then acted a little bit in college and then stepped away sort of age 18 or so I decided um sort of had the you know, the, the, the important 18 year old revelation to get serious and decided that theater was not serious because I'd always been told, you know, if you can do anything else, do it, do not become an artist. It is, you know, and, and I took that to heart and so stepped away um, from all theatrical pursuits and studied economics and political science and had some great professors. And um, I uh, applied to PhD programs in political science and went to UC San Diego briefly. And then age probably 23, 24 realized, oh, a different definition of what it means to be serious. Um, you need to actually have a strong relationship to the thing that you're pursuing. And I felt as a political science PhD student that the questions that I was having to ask were just getting smaller and smaller. They were, you know, it was demanded of me to come up with answerable questions. Um, and I wasn't interested in the answerable. I was interested in the messy. And so I dropped out of a PhD program, started to direct in parking lots in La Jolla and around the UCSD campus. Um, and, uh, and then came to New York. Um, you know, there's more complication in there, but eventually came to New York and um, was a freelance director for 25 years in New York. Um, I'd been approached by a few headhunter types, a few theaters sort of over the years about the possibility of artistic directing. I threw my hat in the ring once, um, and, but, but I kept on, my, my, my freelance career kept on fulfilling. And then um, a few years ago, I started to get itchy again and just sort of wanted to really think about, um, the art form in a bigger way. I, you know, I be I did a lot of union work. I became president of our union, um, the Society of Director and Choreographers (SDC). Um, you know, in an attempt to scratch that itch, and you know, and really see artistic directing as you know, thinking in like, what can you do for the field, and what is a five-year plan as opposed to a three-month plan, and what can you do for others? What are the doors to open? Um, you know, what are what are the stories both necessary and wanted within a community? And you know, it's really interested. Um, you know, I've always been really interested in in promoting you know stories that to like make sure that women are as human as men on the stage. Um, you know, also very interested in, you know, celebrating and hiring and making sure that, you know, BIPOC artists and women feel as comfortable and creative as possible. It's not just about hiring, but creating the surround and that's artistic directing, you know, creating the culture and putting down roots. So that's what took me to ACT. How wonderful. So lucky to have you here in the Bay. Um, Josh, I'm, I know many of our viewers know your, your story. I, I wonder if there's anything that you would add about how you found yourself very specifically in that chair in our office. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll say, I'll, I'll, you know, I was, I, I've been into theater for a long, long time. And um, I had a, you know, the, the sort of big moment for me in my understanding of what I wanted to do as a theater artist came uh, when I was a teenager. And I was uh, really passionate about making plays and being in plays and seeing plays. And, uh, but when I went and saw uh, professional theater, at, you know, I grew up in the East Bay. When I went to San Francisco on a field trip to see a big play in the city, um, it was very clear that this was not intended for me and my peers. It felt like we were going into somebody else's space. Um, and that, um, 
And I could see why so few of my peers were interested in theater because it just felt like it had nothing to do with our lives. And, um, and so I got very interested in, you know, this is a medium that's extremely powerful, being able to be in the same room with the actors who are enacting a story and the ability to experience a narrative in that way um, is so powerful and, and we're missing out on it, right? Because the people who are doing it professionally are making it for the older generation. Um, and so I, uh, you know, I went to college, I studied theater, I came back to Berkeley after college and started a company called Impact Theater, um, which Don, you were a big part of after I left. Um, and, uh, and Impact Theater was all about making theater for people in their teens and 20s. Um, and, and that was, uh, you know, how can we even talk about opening doors, right? It was, it was all about um, claiming uh, theater for the next generation. Um, and that was, uh, you know, really exciting. And we did crazy stuff for four years. And then I, I went off to grad school because I felt like I needed, um, I wanted to do better and better work. I wanted to keep growing as an artist. Um, and I felt like I needed, um, uh, some, you know, butt kicking to happen. Um, and so I went to, went to grad school and got my butt kicked and, um, learned a lot and, um, and sort of spent the next several years, um, going around. I lived in LA while my wife went to grad school. And then I, we came back here and I, I worked at Marin Theater Company, um, and then got a job as the literary manager at Aurora. And, and all that time I was sort of, uh, intending to someday come back to being an artistic director, but I wanted to do it from a, a place of really understanding the regional theater and what, its flaws are and what its strengths are so that when I, you know, if I did become a leader again, that I would be able to um, make the kind of changes um, that I think will lead to theater being more accessible for more people. Um, and so when uh, Tom Ross, my predecessor at Aurora announced that he was going to step down, I put my name in the ring and, and uh, went through the search and, and um, it was, it, that process was so wonderful. I think you guys sort of alluded to this as well, that, that process of having to articulate my vision um, for what I wanted to do, my personal mission for theater, um, in order to apply for the job was, um, was very valuable as an exercise for me um, in, in you know, recommitting to, to what my values actually are and thinking about it. And then of course, you know, my first year as artistic director, we have a, a global pandemic that shuts down theater. And um, so, We'll we'll see how things go after this, but uh, but that's how I ended up um, where I am today. That's so great. I I love this common thread that you've all so clearly articulated of having that personal mission, that that individual um, mission, and it is so in uh, alignment with the quote from George about how you want to open doors for others, whether that's BIPOC artists, making sure that uh, women are living full, robust lives on stage, making sure that young people see theater as a, as a place for them. I know at Aurora, Josh has been uh, furiously working with the staff, with our managing director and the board to kind of recraft our mission statement. Um, so I know it's something that he was eager to be in conversation uh, with the rest of you about too. So, so Josh, why don't you why don't you ask your questions about the mission statement? Yeah, so I'm I'm I, you know I I I like structure and I like um you know when I'm directing a play I really like the idea of of, of getting to that like core idea that's the center of the the play for this production and then making the decisions around uh, the staging of the play and the design of the play so that it all some, somehow fits back to a core vision. I feel like the mission statement for a theater is sort of the same thing. It's this guiding statement that um, that provides uh, a framework for, for all of the work that we do because you're always making decisions as an artistic director about like, are we going to invest our time and energy in this or this? And we go back to the mission. And, um, and I know we're all sort of um, examining our missions and looking at, we were just talking before the show started about this, but, um, but I'm curious, um, Mina, you know, what's, what's, um, what do you see as being like, whether or not we talk about the exact words of your mission, like what is the mission for Crowded Fire and, and how does that guide you in your leadership as artistic director? I mean, I think it's very similar in that, um, you know, we have for the last year been talking about redoing our mission statement and it's going to come after we um, firm up more around our equity work um, and inclusion work within the organization. So uh, I think, um, it's been kind of fascinating that for us in all of the art that we create, it is to be um, provocative, innovative, and absolutely contributing to the creation of a contemporary canon um, that will reflect the powerful plurality of the world in which we live. Um, and in doing so, I think um, 
I'm, I'm constantly in conversation with our resident artists and our literary committee and our staff. And it's about understanding what is invisible and how to make visible what is invisible. Um, and finding the friction points, not necessarily in a straight linear narrative, actually in many ways we have um, trying to move away from a straight linear narrative, um, but the friction points of truth in, especially as we play with form or dialogue or character relationship um, in which a deeper truth comes out when there's friction between two ideas that may seem diametrically opposed or there's two analogous ideas that are moving at the same time and somehow weave together or butt up against each other. Um, and those are the types of plays and um, productions and things that we want to develop. Um, and, you know, we for every year that we have two to three productions happening, we also have four to eight new plays in development. Um, and it's important to us know, not only to connect to the national conversation, but um, even much more importantly for us is how do we shape the local playwrights and artists that are here. And, you know, as an example, and I, there's a part of me that really hates numbers. Okay. Like I really, <laughs> lately I've been really um, struggling with the optics of what, what one is placing in words and placing all over the place and saying out loud versus the actions. I think many of us have been um, reckoning with that in the last several months. Um, but I will say some numbers just because I'm proud of them. Um, since 2009, 98% of the plays we have developed and produced have been written by women, BIPOC, and non-binary playwrights. Um, and that's just one, you know, um, number, but it's it's we haven't been huge about placing all those things on our website and everything, but um, it is something that is beyond number. It's creating a culture of actually listening and of bravery, even if sometimes what we are making is not perfect. I actually want to move away from whatever perfect is or slick is. I'm actually much more interested in something that's deeper and impactful and um, pushes us to look at how we take in the world and the people and care about the people around us. Oh, it's so interesting. Um, uh, Eric, can we go to you next and, and talk about um, uh, mission? And I, I'd love to hear, um, you know, are there ways in which your your vision for Cal Shakes um, has shifted since you've arrived or had that, that how, how your vision and Cal Shakes mission uh, do and do not um, align and how you navigate that as an artistic director? Uh, sure. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? Because uh, I guess I would, you know, I can talk about, so when I first got to Cal Shakes, we went through a strategic planning process and, um, and there was a new mission statement that was created as a consequence of that. I think at the time I remember, I remember sitting down and like going, Oh, I'm going to read a bunch of other theaters mission statements. And the thing that really struck me was that so many of the mission statements that I read across like regional professional theaters um, were kind of basically the same. Like there was a, there was a kind of standard format for mission statements. Um, which is not to say that um, ours was necessarily radical. Like I remember like reading Wooly Mammoth's mission statement and going like, oh, that's the kind of mission statement I want. And then, and then not actually delivering on that. But, um, but I do remember sort of like a, a moment when it, it, for me, it, it clocked that the mission statement was really the opportunity to redirect the boat, right? So these organizations that are so large, um, you know, that's, that's the big, that's your big opportunity. Um, and, you know, when I arrived at Cal Shakes, I think one of the things that I, I, I sort of found myself in resistance with was this notion that was this perception, right, that Shakespeare was a, a, a deeply populist form, you know, uh, that the playwright, you know, there's something about this notion that Shakespeare is the most produced playwright in the country, that it's often produced as free theater in the park, that it's like, it's the things that you like grow up learning in your English classes and, you know, and, um, and I think that I found that I found that really kind of in a way deeply upsetting that notion because uh, you know this thing that everyone was telling me was for everyone was not had not been my experience you know and um, and in that sense it was sort of like oh we we needed to start talking about like what that is because I think as we were looking around 
the country, um, you know, what we were what we were talking about was the shift in um, the the shifting demographics of the country. And this notion that that like like when I landed at Cal Shakes, there were three things that I was told was number one that um, like that were barriers to expanding our audience, diversifying our audience. And, and number one was that we were um, an outdoor theater nestled in the hills of Orinda, a wealthy enclave in the Bay Area. Uh, number two was that we were in the East Bay <laughs> um, and, uh, and that you had to drive to get there. And, and number three was that Shakespeare was in our name. And, uh, and so, you know, for, for me, it's really been it, like writing the mission statement, but also sort of leading the organization has been a kind of dance with that, right? Because I think that there are as many people on my staff who would encourage us to take Shakespeare out of our name as would encourage us to keep it. And for me, holding on to that name is kind of an act of resistance, right? That like, it's about stepping into a space and changing it. Um, and not running away from that space, but rather confronting it and embracing it and shifting it. Um, so from our perspective early on, the idea behind our, our mission statement was um, sort of about like about reimagining, right? Reimagining classical theater for the 21st century, but embedded in that language um, was a kind of recognition that what we were really talking about was we were really talking about decentering these kind of notions of classes. Of, of the classics, right? Which is, was really on some basic fundamental level about decentering whiteness, right? And decentering the Western Eurocentric canon and trying, and, and the way to do that was to sort of invite more voices into that space, to put, to put artists of color on that stage. Um, and then the other component was to stop seeing the art as the sort of primary thing um, and to think about the art as being in relationship with the other programs of the organization to really kind of de-silo this notion that like that art and that everything comes from the art, but rather saying that no, like the, 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 the conversations that we are having with our community partners and collaborators um, should speak to what we think are the priorities of the art that we're putting on our stage. Um, and, and in the same way that the art and the community conversation should speak to what we were putting in the classrooms. Um, you know, and I think you could look at any single one aspect of the organization at the time and you could be like, oh no, this is, you know, this is, this is putting forth an idea that is uninviting, right? To um, the, the larger Bay Area. And this is a space that feels um, divisive, or this is a space that feels elitist, or this is a space that feels privileged. Um, and so a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last few years, as we've been trying to kind of resist that history, that legacy, um, I would say it's definitely shifted the way that we think about who we are today um, in extraordinary ways, um, some more visible than others. And, you know, and we were, we were talking about this just before we started this, this stream, right, which was that, you know, these, like this mission statement of mine, looking back on it, it's only four years old, right, but it's like, it feels ancient. Um, it feels dated, it feels, it feels like something I want to shake off. Um, because I find that we're in a moment of, in time right now where the things that we have been, like we've been shoving this kind of stone up this hill. And all of a sudden, I feel like the hill is sloping in a different direction. Um, and, and now it's a little bit trying to keep up with the stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's all fascinating. Can I ask really quick, one, one, one follow-up question to that is, um, you said at the beginning, um, you were hearing from people, the three things that you were told when you arrived, yeah. is that the barriers to, to, to you know, people attending. Um, who who was telling you? Who are you hearing that from? Oh, staff, board, patrons. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I you know, I mean, I think that I, it's it's an interesting conversation. Um, like, I, and you know, Pam, I, I, every artistic director I've ever spoken to who's like stepped into these organizations and inherited like a kind of legacy, like it is always the same, right? There's like, there's you know, you basically there's there's somebody to speak to anything you could possibly want. <laughs> Right, there's always gonna be somebody on your side and there's always gonna be somebody against you. Um, and I just, I think what uh, what happened when I stepped into Cal Shakes was there was a, I don't know, I think there was, 
there, there are perceptions that come with you taking over the helm of any organization. And, um, and so people see you through that lens, whether you want them to or not. And, and that's often the, how you first meet. And so there were assumptions that were made about me when I took over at Cal Shakes. And, and so the information that was coming to me felt very attuned to what I was, what I would perceive as those assumptions. Um, and I think that it's only, it's about time, right? Time tells you, time tells you what people really want, right? And, and you're either, you're either going to stay with those people or you're going to find new people. Mm, thank you for that. Um, uh, Pam, um, let's talk about ACT a little bit. This is a, a big institution. It's sort of the flagship institution of the Bay Area. Um, I grew up going to acting classes in the Young Conservatory with Craig Slate and everybody. And, um, you know, so it's been a big part of, of my life. I taught there for a long time. Um, uh, are you are you steering this big ship in a new direction? What's your what's your vision and how does that relate to the mission um, of ACT as it has been? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the, this is a, what, a 52, 53 year old organization that was founded um, by, you know, an incredibly charismatic, you know, white man um, when sort of theater as, as cult of genius was celebrated. And, you know, I think, I think that like, like founding moments of theaters really do sort of set set a course and it's it's a you know it's it, it's a big ship um i feel you know really um you know the, uh, like a lot of people when they think of act they think of the geary the geary theater i mean i have i have like a broadway theater which was you know part of my artistic interest in becoming artistic director of you know, it's a Broadway theater far away from Broadway who are artists who should be working at that scale, but aren't working in that 10 block by 10 block, you know, arena in New York. That excited me. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, sort of that, 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 that thing about, you know, about founders, um, you know, I'm finding uh, organizational culture is just so sticky. You know, I'm two years in, um, Don, you know, it's interesting. You thought I was less than one year in. I mean, time is really strange, I think, because as an organizational leader, time is weird, you know, and there are people, there are, you know, now fellow staff members who somehow are carrying the organizational culture from even a time when they weren't even there. But it, like, it, it almost has like, like the ghosts are loud, the ghosts are present, and it takes real work to unwind, unwind things, unwind, you know, practices. And not necessarily that, you know, that, that, that these are, you know, evil practices, but some of them are bad practices. And there's no need to have bad practices. Like I always sort of touch um, because I was a freelance director, perhaps for so long, with no ties to institutions, I try to touch regularly, like the best rehearsal hall practices, you can actually scale them up into organizational practices. And they are about, you know, collaboration. They are about the best idea should win. They are about, you know, transformational learning. They are about prepping, but walking into a space and being ready to discard what you prepped so that so that stuff can really get creative they are about laughter they are about you know sort of um flattening hierarchy um so that you can be really creative and not just you singular but you plural can be really creative so that feels really necessary important you know as an artist that's who i try to be and that's what you know, I believe in, um, and believe can actually scale up. Um, you know, we also stepped into, I was, I was told one, one thing when I got this job, um, from, I think it was, it was either Andre Bishop at Lincoln Center or, or maybe it was Oscar Eustis at the public. Um, uh, uh, one of them said to me, you know, your board is going to want you to do a strategic plan within seconds when you land, push them off. Don't, don't, you know, like make sure you have a little bit of time or you're just going to replicate 
kind of, you know, interview aspirations. You actually need to know something before you can think strategically. So we stepped into, you know, Jennifer, my executive director, and I landed at ACT at approximately the same time, which is, again, a rare opportunity, um, but also a rare responsibility because both of us were brand new. Um, we stepped into a strategic planning process about a year into our tenure and then had several moments where we had to say, whoa, the terrain just got crazy. We have to stop you know, whoa, the terrain got even crazier, we have to stop. And so we're sort of in this, you know, our strategic plan is probably more about like a long-term plan. Um, when, when I was interviewing for ACT, I remember searching the website. Number one, it's a bad website. We're, we're going to work on that. We have to work on that. But number two, searching the website for the ACT mission statement, and I couldn't find it. And then I did eventually find it, but to me, sort of to your point, Eric, um, yeah, flash that one up. Um, you know, it, it didn't read as a mission statement to me because it wasn't active enough. And maybe again, because I'm a director, so I search for verbs, you know, it, it didn't have verbs. It just had, we do this, we do this, we do this. Um, you know, so so even, you know, and, and, and some of that's generational. And I think in theater, generations run like every eight years. Like you don't, you know, it's not like, someone is 25 years older to be of a different generation. Um, and, you know, and, and times change, you know, and, and also, I mean, I mean, there's some mission statements out there in regional theaters that read like they were concocted by MBA, you know, holders and others that feel like, oh, I think an artist had, had something to do with this. Um, you know, so, what, so what's been exciting, yeah, it is to talk about how active a mission statement can be to try to, as, you know, Eric, you were bringing up, to try to, you know, make sure that, you know, our education community programs are artistic and our artistic, you know, work is, is throughout and that marketing actually is an art form, you know, and that we're all storytellers and that, you know, to have a mission statement, you know, I'm just glancing at our brand new one. I won't read it, but, you know, it has verbs like engage, activate, promote, empower. You know, we talk a lot about inclusion, but inclusion gets broken down into transparency, collaboration, trust, and respect. You know, also, you know, ACT didn't have any statement of values. Um, and I, I actually think that in a day-to-day -day workplace, it's really important to just have that shared vocabulary, you know, and, you know, and a shared vocabulary about what you're doing and, and how you want to do it. If you can put that out there, then you can also live up to it and people can demand, you know, it's about, it's, a, it's about accountability. If you put it out there beyond yourself, then you are accountable to it. And in a day-to-day -day way, it can help guide what you're doing. So, because we can do a lot of stuff, but if it doesn't sort of go back to, you know, some basic tenants for the organization, then, then we're going to get in trouble. You know, it's going to get, you know, really naughty and will be led by charisma. And I'm actually not interested in that. Mm, so interesting. Um, uh, I want to hear about, um, Pam, let's just keep going with you for a second. Um, how, you know, we're all, of course, dealing with uh, the, the shutdown and the COVID-19 pandemic right now. And that's um, thrown all of our plans um, into, you know, chaos for a while. Um, but I'm curious both um, how ACT is planning to, to weather this um, and come out the other side. And then also, like, what... Um, how do you see the organization, you know, a few years from now when things have reopened, what's going to be different about the work that ACT is doing and the way it does its work um, uh, when we're able to do our work again? Yeah, it's a really hard time, you know, and none of us on this call, and I would gather to, you know, I would say that really no organization in the country, no theater in the country is necessarily guaranteed to come out the other side like we it's not like we have you know a huge endowment it's not like we have even a savings account like it's you know it's really really tricky tricky times with no revenue coming in i mean right now i'm leading um you know a a a new media company that didn't know it was a new media company 
um, and, you know, have certainly, you know, ACT, you know, also has as part of it, you know, very central to it is a conservatory training program, you know, is so proud that, you know, our core faculty and students and some guest artists pivoted hard and fast in March and put out, I think, some amazing, you know, live Zoom productions that were supposed to be in person. Um, and we learned a lot. We learned, you know, that even as a big organization that we could pivot. Um, so that feels great. Um, ACT is definitely going to be smaller, you know, and smaller definitionally means, you know, we've laid people off. That's really hard. This is, you know, through nobody's fault of their own. Um, you know, I've, I've, you know, yeah, I've had to, you know, dare I say, change lives. You lay people off. That's really hard. Um, you know, we, we, it's, it's really hard to plan as everyone knows right now, you know, we're, we're, we're aiming for, we're, we're, you know, we're trying to be a fact-based organization, unlike a lot of this country, it feels like the leadership of this country. Um, we need to make sure that, you know, our artists, our students, our audience are safe um, when we return. Um, and that's going to be many months away. And I, you know, I predict we'll be smaller. I mean, you know, for, for, for a time, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful, um, that, you know, smaller gets us, you know, in a weird way, organizationally, culturally healthier. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, even, you know, that, you know, I feel we're in, um, uh, a, another civil rights movement. I'm hopeful that, you know, that more, um, you know, people both within theater, but outside of theater really start to not just reflect, but also demand and participate in unwinding, you know, systemic racism. And that this conversation, you know, really continues so that, so that everyone is pointed, you know, in, in the direction of change. And that I think could actually be really exciting. You know, if I sort of say, if we can survive, theaters might be hugely useful on the other side, hugely useful as like essential gathering places, you know, to be transformational, to bring up both joyous as well as difficult conversations. Um, and really be part of big, broad, sweeping change, um, you know, that we can make, um, that we can make manifest. So I feel hopeful, but I, I know we're, we're looking at, you know, some really difficult times. Yeah, let's, let's go with that. I want to, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about um, systemic racism and systemic oppression in the theater community, both locally and nationally. Um, and uh, Eric, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, I know we as uh, artistic directors in the Bay Area have had, you know, we've had weekly meetings in a Slack group and talk about all kinds of things. Um, uh, what, what, how, how is Cal Shakes addressing, I know you guys just did a, a, a sort of town hall um, uh, looking at, uh, at this, but I want, I'd love to hear you talk about your plans for Cal Shakes and, and both in terms of the pandemic, but also in terms of what you're doing uh, to dismantle systems of oppression that may have existed uh, at Cal Shakes. Softball. Thanks, Josh. Um, no, yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I, I really, um, it's interesting, right? Because I really appreciate something you said earlier, Pam, about um, the director's craft and, and how the work that we do, just thinking about all of us here tonight, right, as directors, right, thinking a little bit about like what our superpowers are. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, I, I agree, like, I think that, I think, I think there's something about our craft that um, I think if we think about this in the right way, will guide us through this. Um, there's something about the craft of like holding space um, for often a room full of strangers in that first rehearsal and what it means to be able to like lead that space into really vulnerable conversations really quickly, right? To kind of like, basically uh, like we have, like one thing that we are very good at is we're very good at generating brave spaces quickly. 
Um, and if we can if we can make those spaces, uh, if we can make those spaces lasting spaces, um, I think that there's uh, that's 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 a power, right? And I think you know we've we've often leaned upon our art to to create those spaces because art is I mean such a powerful force. And I think at Cal Shakes we've been you know obviously asking like what it means to be a theater when you can't make theater. Right when you can't when you can't create those experiences of of being in other people's company, in like a room and listening to a story in that way, like what can you do? Um, and so you know, I would I would offer that we're, um, I mean, for Cal Shakes at least, what we've decided to do, and and really largely a, a consequence of the moment that we're in, you know, we've been inspired by this movement towards racial justice and and like from our perspective, the best thing that we can do in this moment is to marshal what limited resources we have in support of that change. Um, and that that change can be both within the organization and within our community as theaters and within our community as the Bay Area. Um, and we're looking at how to, how to accomplish that. And I think that, you know, you mentioned a membership model earlier, Josh, right? And I think that, you know, I, 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 we've, we've also been looking at that pretty, pretty strongly and, and partly because, you know, again, from our perspective, uh, the lens that we're looking at is sort of what are the practices of our organization um, that feel like they've contributed to the systems that you're describing. And, you know, and I would offer that the subscription model um, is largely one of those things, right? It's 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 a it's it's essentially created these um, uh, monolithic bodies that our organizations are in service of, and that often doesn't allow for the kind of um, risk that we sometimes associate and with bringing a diverse voices onto our stage. And the fact that I'm naming it a risk at all is a consequence of that body, right? And, um, you know, we, there's plenty of responsibility to go around in terms of how this structure got built and how, like, like I mean, most of, most regional theaters were built upon a subscription model, right? It, like it started that way. And, um, and I think somewhere along the way, many of our organizations sort of lost sight of the importance of, of like who was in your audience as much as who was on your stage. And that the, the experience of, not just seeing a story that is unlike yours on stage, but also to be sitting in a space with someone that is unlike you, sharing in that story that it is like, it is a 360 degree experience, right? This is not about sitting across from a screen. This is about sitting in the middle of a thing. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's the thing that we keep coming back to is sort of like, we see this as a period of transition um, we definitely don't see ourselves returning to anything like what we were, um, but we see ourselves moving towards something that we hope will be better um, in all the ways that matter. And, uh, and that the way to get there um, is often through a kind of crucible. And I think that that's kind of what we're all in right now, um, that this moment is as much opportunity as, as anything. And I think if we if we are able to marshal our kind of collective craft, right, um, in service of that vision, which I think there's not a single person that I know in this art form that doesn't want that, that we can get there. Um, and if we get there, uh, I, I, you know, um, my job will be done and I will walk away. <laughs> What does it look like, Eric? What is what is that? When it, no, when don't you, ask me that. <laughs> uh, okay, all right, all right, all right. You'll tell us later. You'll tell us later. I, sure. I can't wait to find out what what the website looks like. There you go. Um, uh, Mina, um, will you weigh in on all of this about uh, with Crowded Fire and what you guys are doing, both um, in terms of the pandemic and in terms of uh, making the world a better place for more people? <laughs> I feel like that's been the flag for generations even before mine, right? And the question is, is how to actually do that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think um, along with many other theater companies and very much what Pam and Eric have both said is it's a moment of suspension. Um, it is also in, in a moment of reflection 
a realization in the actions that we all made, both difficult and sometimes um, outside of our control, um, a situation where we've seen our artistic communities really um, released sort of without any kind of safety net. Um, and so what we've been focusing on in this moment, which I agree must be transformational because I don't know, frankly, as an artist, if I want to come back to the same thing. Um, it, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work for so many of us. And there is um, a systemic oppression of so many of our BIPOC artists and administrators. Um, and it has been, you know, negated or um, kind of suppressed our, our sort of experience has been suppressed or capitalized upon in terms of racial capitalism on our stages. And so, you know, we're having um, as Crowded Fire, uh, both on staff, on our board, and our resident artist team, which is immensely diverse, all of which is immensely diverse. We've been, and you know, using again that word <laughs> carefully, um, we've been working in the space for a decade and even really much more deeply in the last four to five years. Um, and I think the, the primary question is, how did we get so far from being essential to each other and the fabric of our communities? And um, this idea that we're reflecting humanity on our stages or that um, we are setting, you know, stories are, va are show us our value. And when certain stories are invisible or um, when they, when we value one, sort of space for stories over another or one person's or one community's stories over another, that's an imbalance. And so like, how do we come back into balance with the reason for our existence and the reason for why we make art in the first place? Um, how do we engage with the ritual of what theater is? And, you know, also as Eric said, we're not, what are we when we're not a, a theater making theater? Um, because we haven't actually chosen to go virtual um, in many different ways. We've used this time to really def start to talk as a community um, and think in terms of concentric, concentric circles. So we've been having um, a couple times a week actually long table discussions about just what it does this moment call for. Um, and trying to make sure we're centering our Black and BIPOC voices. And already we were on a charge um, to um, put first a sharing economy because we're small, right? And it is the theaters of color and the smaller theaters that are not given the same sort of resources or offer um, opportunities for those same resources. And so how do we um, continue to center the most essential voices without those things. Um, and so we've, you know, we're actually in a new model partnership with Golden Thread Productions, the first Middle Eastern theater company in the country. So we're sharing staff, we're sharing backend resources, we share space. Um, we are working with Campo Santo. So we just got the uh, Mellon Playwright Residence um, with Star Finch, who is a phenomenal black female playwright from the Bay Area. Um, we already got the Gerbodi um, with Lisa Marie Rollins, who's also another incredible local black female artist um, uh, and carries a multiplicity of identities. I mean, like all of this work, we have been intentional and slow and thoughtful about. And now it feels like the urgency of this moment where it's actually possible that you know, we who have been sort of like focusing on our sphere because it was just, we were all frankly tired of wasting our time trying to change the larger sphere. It felt like it was never gonna happen. It was that boulder pushing that boulder up the, the hill. But this is actually the moment where we can engage the knowledge and, and listen um, and learn. And um, this concentric circle of crowded fire 
will then can affect the next concentric circle because everyone's in a position of readiness now to listen for what feels like the first time in my life. Um, and then the concentric circle outside of that. So then regionally and nationally, what conversations can we really impact? Um, so, you know, it comes back to how in the same way that our politics is really problematic, how do we stop thinking of the individual? How do we um, defund or redistribute? Um, and I know this has been generations. Some people are like, I've been here before and it's no lie, you know, but like, how do we truly give for those of us who have, how do we give up what we have in service to our community and to other people? And I think that is that is what we've been focusing on in this moment um, and our artists, putting our artists first and our staff. So um, we've been lucky. We're very flexible. We are not furloughing anyone um, till the end of the week. I mean, we know we're really good through the end of the year and probably through next year. So we're just using this time to go deep and really strengthen those folks that we've been in contact with and continue to listen to who needs to be at the center of the conversation and challenge people to be transparent and vulnerable and, and step into the change. And it's going to hurt and it's going to be hard and that's okay. Because if not now, then when? Because I am yeah. not shuffling this over to the next generation. I like, there is no more excuses. It's like we have everything. We we we've, we've known the answers for all these years. So like, can we just get to work? <laughs> so yeah, that's so inspiring. Um, yeah, I all, all of you are so inspiring. And as somebody who is like still sort of on that path, still aspires even after all of this to be an artistic director one day, I still have so many questions. I want to talk to you about season planning and how do you actually, really, and truthfully spend your days. Um, but in this moment, I want to be super respectful of your time and our time is drawing to a close. So I think I will um, just leave it with one final question to each of you. And that is, um, what is bringing you joy or what are you looking forward to in this moment? I see, I see you pondering. Uh, I'll go. Um, I will say, you know, as, as someone who started off by saying that I got into this field for fellowship, um, that uh, a consequence of this sort of period of isolation has actually been an extraordinary amount of organizing um, that I see happening. I see happening on the board that Pam and I both serve on. Um, I see happening amongst um, uh, our theaters here in the Bay Area. Um, and, and I see happening kind of across the country in ways that I have not seen before, I think in part because so many of us have nothing to do. I mean, not really, but you know what I mean? And, um, and I just think that there's, you know, there, 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 it's like, uh, there's nothing like having a, a common enemy, <laughs> um, uh, to, to unite, to, to create a united front. But, you know, I, I think that. I think that the hope is is that we don't we don't um, we don't count on that as uh, the answer because I think that you know our our role is to continue to discover nuance mm. in these spaces like it's again back to our craft that's what we do is that we don't we don't look for like clear broad stroke good and evil we look for all of the different facets of what that means um, and so our one of our jobs I think is to continue to push for nuanced conversations, for active listening, um, for a real sense of self-reflection. Um, and, uh, and that if we can do that, that's where the change is gonna be. Wonderful. Pam? Oh, and I agree with that. And I also, I, I mean, I feel also really strongly and it feels really, you know, I feel really fortunate that you know, because none of us are doing what we usually do, that, you know, a, a partnership, you know, ACT, a small downtown theater in New York, Crowded Fire, you know, um, 
you know, some, you know, a theater, a small theater in Denver. I mean, sort of like, like, like scale doesn't matter. We're all sort of working at the same scale. We're all talking about similar things in, you know, perhaps, you know, sort of tethered to our own, you know, our own spaces, our own communities, but really we're talking about the same stuff, which feels fantastic. Um, and, um, and hard. I mean, you know, we, we at, um, you know, at ACT um, last week, we started to really look at, um, at the document, the, the, the first document coming out of um, We See You, White American Theater, and really looking at it, you know, as a text, the way one would as a text, you know, and so sort of the artistic team of four or five people sort of going through it. And how do you, how do you read this paragraph? And how does it, you know, what, what, what memories come to mind about you being in a specific moment, a spe specific place, whether you had privilege, whether, or whether it was a safe, uh, you know, whether it was a place that felt unsafe and really, and then, and then trying to get beyond that next step is what can we as an organization do to make it better? Um, you know, but, and I think, I think that's happening in a lot of places right now. So, you know, I, I really appreciate like sort of the like collaboration across the country, conversation across the country, irrespective of scale of and, 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 and how people normally think of particular theaters. And I just, I feel that there's a lot of brain power and the conversations are rigorous right now. Mina, what's bringing you joy or what are you looking forward to in this moment? I agree. I mean, it's a moment of organizing. I feel like the revolutionary zeal. It's like giving me life. Um, I'm hopeful. I'm actually hopeful. And I'm also cooking a lot. I didn't know I could cook. I never was home to cook. I'm really enjoying that. Um, and I'm good at it. And I've been drawing, going back to my roots. I'm going to show you. I'm going to do a little showing. Oh, wow. How amazing. Wow. <laughs> So that's been bringing me joy. So while we were doing play playwriting lab, I'm drawing. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm trying to find ways to generate and be creative and um, also have my mind in the organizing mode as well and learning, learning uh, about how a movement happens. Um, and it's just been thrilling um, and hard. And uh, I'm hopeful. <laughs> It's been so great to have the three of you join Josh and I, and I, and I hope that we'll have you back on a future season of Aurora Connect so that we can talk about season planning and how you spend your days. <laughs> um, Cause I still want all the cheats and tricks <laughs> of the job. Um, but I'm gonna hand it over to Josh now cause I know he's looking forward to sharing some information with our viewers. Yeah, we're looking to lift up some other organizations that are inspiring us in different ways. So I just want to point you all to the Okra Project, which is a collective that seeks to address the global crisis faced by Black trans people by bringing home-cooked, healthy, and culturally specific meals and resources to Black trans people. Through grocery funds, community building, and mental health resources, the Okra Project nourishes Black trans bodies and souls. And they are at the theokraproject.com. So I encourage you to go and check them out. So, so dope. Uh, I'm just going to remind you that memberships for our 2020-2021 season are available now. These will include a ticket to any live theater we are able to produce through July 21, as well as all of our online content, including original audio drama from Cleavon Smith, Lauren Gunderson, and Jonathan Spector. It is going to be fire. And uh, I'll remind you that you can send questions. Uh, you can comment. You can give us feedback all at connects at auroratheater.org, connects at auroratheater.org. And uh, next week, um, we are off next week because uh, it's uh, it's uh, July 3rd and, and the, the theater is closed for the holiday. Uh, but we'll be back the week after that on July 10th uh, with Lance Gardner, who is a wonderful Bay Area actor and also a new board member at Aurora Theater Company. And he will be talking about uh, about himself and his career, but also about Supernova Goes Virtual, which is our annual celebration of Aurora and our community. Lance is going to be the MC. I'm really looking forward to the party and to uh, having Lance on the show. Um, thank you for watching. 
I always forget to plug that you can also get this in audio format wherever you get your podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, et cetera. Um, thanks to our guests, tremendous artistic leaders who I have long admired. And thank you for staying connected.